to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the previous video, we talked about the replication cycle of the coronavirus of 2019, which we termed COVID-19. In this video, we're going to talk about its pathophysiology, and then we're also going to look and see how it evades the host cell immune system. So hopefully this is an interesting video to you. So first of all, a couple of things about the coronavirus. Um, we called it COVID-19. Now, to be perfectly clear, when we say COVID-19, we're actually talking about the disease that it causes, not the actual name of the virus. Okay? Uh, so the disease name that this virus causes is coronavirus disease, COVID-19 for short. Okay? The actual name of the virus is Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, obviously abbreviated to SARS-CoV-2. Okay? So this is actually the name of the virus, and then up here, coronavirus disease is the name of the disease it causes. This is very similar to HIV and AIDS. So the virus's name is HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, whereas the disease that it causes is AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. So again, two different things. And a lot of the information that I'm using here in this video comes from this review paper right here from DeWitt et al., uh, 2016, and I'll post a link to that in the description of this video. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology of the coronavirus. And it really doesn't matter if we're talking about MERS or SARS, both of these pretty much use the same mechanisms with only subtle differences that we're really not going to talk about here. Okay? So the first thing that we have to understand is that the virus which is shown right here, has these proteins on its periphery called spike proteins. Now, alluding to the previous video, we actually mentioned one function of these spike proteins. So these are proteins that exist on the periphery of the viral capsid. Now, on the cell that it's infecting, which is a cell of the lung tissue, these cells express this receptor called CEACAM1. Uh, this protein normally has other functions, but it can actually bind these spike proteins on the periphery of the virus. And so when the spike protein binds to this receptor in the membrane, it facilitates receptor-mediated endocytosis. And so this virus is then pulled into the cell, and then it uncoats, releasing the RNA genome. And then we talked about all this in that video. Now the spike protein here is going to have another function, and it's going to bind to a protein, it's actually an enzyme, called ACE2. ACE2 is an isoform of angiotensin-converting enzyme. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but the point is, is when the spike proteins of the virus bind to ACE2, that triggers the downregulation of ACE2. That just means that the levels of ACE2 drop. And this is bad for two reasons. One is this bullet point right here. Whenever ACE2 gets downregulated, so there's lower levels of ACE2, we tend to see more lung injury. And that's because ACE2, unlike the ACE1, which you're used to hearing about, has a natural protective effect on the lung. And so it protects the lung against acute injury. Okay? Really what it's doing is whenever there is acute lung injury, it facilitates the healing process of the lung. Okay? But if ACE2 is downregulated, then we're going to have a greater degree of net lung injury. Okay? Now for the second function of ACE2, we need to really look at this pathway right here. Now you may have seen this pathway in anatomy and physiology. This is the RAS pathway, renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, although we're not including aldosterone. But let's talk about this. So the liver produces an inactive protein called angiotensinogen. And angiotensinogen at all times is circulating in the blood. Okay? But it's inactive. Now in response to low blood pressure and really low blood volume, the kidneys, which constantly monitor that blood volume, can release an enzyme called renin. Renin is an enzyme that converts angiotensinogen into this protein, which is only minimally active, called angiotensin 1. This angiotensin 1 is going to circulate in the blood until it gets to the lungs, where it's going to encounter one of two enzymes either ACE1 or ACE2, and both of these ACEs are angiotensin-converting enzymes. What they do is they convert the inactive, or mostly inactive, angiotensin-1 into the fully active angiotensin-2. 
Now, angiotensin II itself has a lot of functions. Uh, one of those functions is actually to increase blood pressure. Um, and that makes sense because if the stimulus for renin release is low blood volume and low blood pressure, one of the jobs of the body is to maintain constant blood pressure because if blood pressure fails, perfusion to tissues also fails. So this is a negative feedback system to get angiotensin II, which then does some functions to raise blood pressure back up. And we're not going to talk about all those in this video. Uh, but the other thing that angiotensin II can do is it can bind to receptors in the lungs called angiotensin II receptors, or type 1A to be specific, and it increases the vascular permeability in the lungs. Okay? So that's what angiotensin II is doing. Now here's where the problem arises. Okay. We have two forms of this enzyme, ACE2 and really ACE1. Normally they'll just call this ACE. This ACE1 is the one you're used to hearing about in anatomy. When you downregulate ACE2, there's a compensatory increase in ACE1. That's just negative feedback. However, ACE1 has a lot more activity than ACE2. And so what ends up happening is, if you have a lot of activity of ACE1, then you're going to get a lot of angiotensin II, excessive angiotensin II. That makes sense because ACEs are the enzymes that convert angiotensin I into angiotensin II. So if you have excessive ACE1 activity, you're going to have excessive angiotensin II. You're also going to have excessive binding to this angiotensin II receptor. To be more specific, it's this type 1A angiotensin II receptor. And this is a receptor that we actually see in the tissue of the lungs. And its function when bound is to increase pulmonary vascular permeability. That's going to help bring fluid into the lungs. You could obviously see why that's bad. So again, we get excessive pulmonary vascular permeability, and that itself leads to pathology. Okay? That leads to tissue damage in the lungs, and also if ACE2 is inhibited, be it its downregulation by the spike protein, then you can't protect against that acute lung injury. So this is very bad. And so collectively, these bullet points right here really explain why this virus causes severe acute respiratory syndrome. So now let's switch gears and talk about the immunopathology of the coronavirus. So prolonged infection can cause this thing to progress to acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS. And one thing that you will see in people who are infected with this, assuming it progresses to this point, is you'll see a ton of pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. Now again, remember that cytokines are chemical messengers that are released by immune cells generally, and they do things to mediate or trigger immune responses. Okay? These are sort of like the signals for war. Chemokines are also called chemoattractants. Chemokines are really just signals that get immune cells to the proper location. Okay? So cytokines don't do any good if those immune cells can't be in the proper location. So chemokines direct other immune cells to the active site of the infection. And there's a bunch of these that we expect to be elevated in people who are infected with the coronavirus. For example, interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-8, interleukin-6. And then we have some of these over here, CXC chemokine ligand number 10, or CXCL10, and CC chemokine ligand 2, CCL2. What's very important is that patients that fully recovered from SARS, so those that survived, versus those that succumbed to the illness, had early expression of several proteins. One, the CXCL10, also CCL2, and then also these antiviral proteins, which are called interferons. So interferon alpha and interferon gamma. And then, of course, some other proteins encoded by interferon-stimulated genes. So generally, we'll just say interferon alpha and gamma. If we look at some of these functions right here, uh, interferon alpha is an antiviral protein that's released by an infected cell. So I'll zoom in right here so we can see a little bit of this. I won't go into too much detail. Uh, but essentially, when we're looking at interferon function, here's a uh, host cell 1 over here. This is the infected cell. So you can see here the virus has entered the cell. And through a bunch of mechanisms that are inherent in most cells, anytime a cell is infected with a virus, it'll start generating interferons, in particular interferon alpha. So interferon alpha is produced by the infected cell and it's released. 
And so this interferon alpha that's released by the infected cell serves as a signal to nearby cells that tells the nearby cells, hey, we need to start making an antiviral program, okay, which is inherent in most cells. It needs to start making antiviral proteins. Okay? And so that way other cells that are nearby can be more or less protected. Also, we have interferon gamma. This is an antiviral protein that's released by immune cells, so not by the infected cell. Uh, what we see is that interferons alpha and beta, not mentioned here, actually trigger other immune cells like uh, macrophages and so on and so forth to start releasing interferon gamma. Interferon gamma uh, actually triggers some aspects of the immune system to destroy those particular cells that are infected. And then, of course, we have CXCL10 and CCL2, which are both chemokines or chemoattractants, um, and they're released in order to guide other white blood cells, so immune cells, to the infected area to destroy the infected cell. Without these, the white blood cells would have no idea where to go. One other important aspect of this is that the adaptive immune response is actually shown to be vital to survival. Now you might say that's trivial. Of course the adaptive immune system is necessary. Well here's two points. One, uh, the adaptive immune response is not necessary for fighting off certain infections. Okay? In some cases the innate immune response may actually be sufficient. But the adaptive immune response is necessary here. What they found is that a severe disease pathology, so people that get this really bad and often succumb to the disease, it correlates very strongly with a failure to switch from the innate immune response to an adaptive immune response. And so what that means is that these people are not able to form a memory response. They're not able to form memory cells to this. So in other words, they're not able to generate a memory response or memory cells to this virus, but certain aspects of the adaptive immune response, so the specific immune response, they're not able to do in a timely fashion, like generate enough antibodies and uh, appropriate effector cells to combat this virus. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. The very last thing we're going to talk about in this video is very briefly just how this virus, SARS-CoV-2, is able to evade the host immune system. And this is going to be fairly consistent whether we're talking about any other strain of SARS-CoV or MERS-CoV. Now, you can see here a bunch of proteins, these circular proteins, these are blue and green, that are actually made by certain uh, coronaviruses. So the green ones are for SARS-CoV. That's what our coronavirus of 2019 is. And then the blue one is MERS-CoV, which is also very dangerous. And you can see here, for example, that SARS-CoV is going to generate a number of proteins. Here's N, 3B, M, 3B, 6, and so on and so forth. And you can see that these proteins actually inhibit a lot of natural processes in here that are required to produce inflammation. Okay? Um, if we go over here to NF-kappa-B, this is a very, very important transcription factor for pro-inflammatory cytokines. You can see here that naturally when NF-kappa B is activated, it goes into the cell's nucleus to an NF-kappa B response element in the DNA, and you get upregulation of a bunch of pro-inflammatory cytokines. These are then released out of the cell, and they therefore will trigger certain aspects of the immune response, which lead to the destruction of cells that are virally infected. However, what we see here is there's a bunch of places where SARS-CoV can inhibit this process, whether directly or earlier in the pathway. For example, this N protein can bind to the viral RNA and prevent it from being detected by host proteins, such as MDA5 and Rig1. If these proteins actually detect viral RNA, they trigger the cell to be destroyed. If MDA5 and Rig1 detect viral RNA, they either will trigger biochemical events to destroy that RNA, or it'll eventually lead to the cell's death. Okay? But if this N protein is bound to this RNA, then these proteins have trouble detecting it. Also, the virus's 3B protein, which actually does correspond to this subgenomic RNA that we talked about in the previous video, this 3B protein inhibits MDA5 and Rig1. So even if these proteins were able to get around to the RNA, they wouldn't be able to trigger the processes downstream because they're inhibited by this 3B protein. Now, if for some reason these MDA5 and Rig1 proteins were able to function, 
what they would normally do is activate these MAVs proteins on the surface of the mitochondrion, and then those proteins would in turn allow the activation of ubiquitin kinases and ligases. Now these are important because they do two things. One, you can see over here that they lead to the production of active NF-kappa B, which then goes into the nucleus and upregulates pro-inflammatory cytokines. But what these ubiquitin kinases and ligases also do is they activate other transcription factors like IRF3 and IRF7, which then go into the nucleus and upregulate interferons. So we get the production of, let's say, interferon alpha or interferon gamma if this is an immune cell. Okay? We have other proteins that inhibit these processes as well. So for example, the SARS-CoV M protein inhibits the E3 ubiquitin kinases and ligases. 3B and 6 protein inhibit the phosphorylation of IRF3 and IRF7, so the, therefore these transcription factors cannot go into the nucleus, and therefore you cannot get upregulation of the interferons at the DNA level. Also, we see that this protein, PL-PRO, is able to inhibit the activation of NF-kappa B. Therefore, we get no NF-kappa B, no response in the nucleus, and no upregulation of those pro-inflammatory cytokines. And you can look at this for the MERS-CoV as well. And you can see that there's other points where the MERS-CoV proteins inhibit this process. So there are subtle differences, like I mentioned. But the overall result is going to be the same. We're going to see a failure to produce enough pro-inflammatory cytokines. We're going to see a drop in the number of interferons. And this is one of the ways that the coronavirus is going to be able to evade the host immune system. Okay? So, hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the pathogenesis of the coronavirus of 2019, SARS-CoV-2. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.